Hello everybody, I'm Ken, part of the ministry team at LCM. Welcome to our online service this morning. Sometimes people, uh, when they greet me, say, G'day Ken, how are you travelling? Uh, it used to be, how are you going? Um, and it probably will go back to that unless COVID goes away soon. <laughs> how are you travelling, they say. And I, I can't help thinking a more important question to be asking me, which will be more helpful for my spiritual growth, will be, where are you heading? Where are you heading? You see, pilots and ship's captains constantly have to reassess their heading, reassess what compass bearing they're going to be steering their ship or their plane on to arrive at their destination. They've got to take into account winds and currents, which will nudge them off course. They've got to take into account mountains and rocky reefs and thunderstorms that they'll have to negotiate. Well, today we've got Chris uh, Edwards, our regional bishop, with us, and he'll be talking about uh, how realities uh, set our heading. And as we've been looking at Mark's gospel, confronted with the reality of who Jesus really is. Julian will be reading to us from Psalm 143. And David, when he writes this psalm, is on the run. Saul is hunting him down to kill him. And David's in despair. And he links the way I should go, his heading, he links that with God's love. Listen to what he says. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me. Well, we're going to sing now of that love, of God's love that leads us and guides us and shapes us and forms us and changes us from glory into glory. Love divine, all loves excelling.
Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless, let us be. What a great prayer. Well, Psalm 143 actually begins with a confession and a plea for mercy. Listen to what David says. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness answer me, in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. So let's now come before God, trusting in his mercy and his faithfulness and his righteousness and say this prayer together. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that through the death and resurrection of your Son Jesus Christ we have forgiveness of sins and full reconciliation with you. In your mercy you've made us clean in your sight even though we still fail to love you and our neighbour, please continue to renew us by your grace and change us by your spirit, that we may live to please you in every way for the glory of Jesus Christ, in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. Now, some of you have noticed some of these boxes that have been behind the chair. The thing is, these containers, they all look pretty good, but the problem is that one of them is empty on the inside. But just looking at them, I can't really tell which one is empty on the inside, but if we look at the inside, so I was just struggling a little bit with the lid. Oh, just there we go. Oh, well done for those who guessed that. It's only when we can look on the inside that we see which one was the empty one. And this is going to help us with today's story, because in today's story, Jesus used a fig tree that looked good on the outside to show what was wrong with Israel, who are God's people on the inside. So we're starting with this bare tree trunk, but when we add some leaves and some fruit... What's going to look like a nice, healthy tree? Does anyone here have any trees at their home? Put your hand up if you do. Lots of trees at home. What about any fruit trees at home? Does anyone have a fruit tree? Liam, what trees do you have at home? I've got lemon trees, mandarin trees and orange trees. Lemon, mandarin and orange trees. Delicious. So this is the tree that we have. looks like a nice, healthy tree. Then we have this man called an Israelite. So an Israelite, we just said before, was people who um, sometimes would uh, read the Bible. They would listen to God and they would read the Bible. They would also pray to God. Sometimes when we pray to God, we might put our hands together like this picture shows so we don't distract other people. Uh, The Israelites, they also went to the temple. And when they were at the temple, they offered sacrifices to God as a way of saying sorry for the wrong things that they had done. So when Jesus came to Jerusalem, he expected to find people who loved God and wanted to please God every day. 
But on Jesus' way to the temple, he saw a fig tree, which looked good in the distance, but when he got closer, it had no fruit, only leaves. Jesus then went to the temple and he saw people selling animals. This wasn't bad in and of itself, but Jesus knew the people were not really sorry to God. They were offering a sacrifice to God, but their hearts showed that they weren't really friends with God. Unfortunately, they didn't love God. Some of the Israelites were like this tree. The tree looked good on the outside, but it had no fruit. And the Israelites, well, they wanted to look good on the outside, but on the inside, they did not trust God. A Christian could be a boy or a girl. That's a word for someone who trusts in Jesus. Well, they also might read the Bible and they might pray. Sometimes they might go to church. But most importantly, Christians are people who trust in Jesus' death on the cross, which makes us friends with God. Going to church, reading the Bible and praying are all good things, but God cares about what's on the inside and whether we trust God more than the things that we do ourselves. Hi, I'm Kitty, and this is my husband, Sunda, and we normally attend the 10 a.m. service at St. Andrews. Um, we've been asked to talk about um, how we became Christians and why we're still a Christian today. Um, so I grew up in a Christian family, and growing up, church has always been a, a big part of, um, of my childhood. Um, I can't really remember the day that I gave my life to Jesus, but it was something that happened over time during my teenage years that um, Jesus revealed himself to me through the words in the Bible. And um, that's how um, I became a Christian. Um, today, I continue to put my trust in him um, because through many situations in my life, he has shown me that um, he certainly is in control and that I can indeed um, Put my trust in him. Yeah. Uh, well, my story is pretty similar as well. Uh, I was raised in a, in a Christian home, uh, but as I was finishing school and entering uni, I started going to this uh, youth fellowship at church. And it was there where I realized uh, just being raised in a Christian family doesn't make you Christian, but you need to uh, personally make a call and like, give your life to Christ. And uh, through teachings there, I realized this one and uh, I gave my life to Christ there. And over the years, I've had uh, various situations where I've had doubts and, uh, and, and yeah, there have been challenges and so on. And uh, always the message of the Bible uh, has given me courage to face the situation. Uh, it gives me assurance that I'm not alone. Uh, and also, it, it tells me that this was not God's original plan and this is not the end as well. There's a, there's a better place coming and uh, our, it's, it's, it's assured that we can get there by trusting in Jesus. And uh, that's just beautiful and that answers uh, a lot of questions for me and always gives me strength to, to carry on. Uh, so that's the reason I'm still a Christian. Hi, my name's Julian. I'm married to Shan and our three kids, we all go to Lane Cove at 10 a.m. The reading tonight comes from Psalm chapter 143. O Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into your judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. The enemy pursues me, he crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in darkness. Like those long dead, so my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love.
for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Rescue me from my enemies, O Lord, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. In your unfailing love, silence my enemies. Destroy all my foes, for I am your servant. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's now affirm together our trust in the faithfulness and the love and the righteousness of David's God, who's revealed himself more fully to us in Jesus Christ. Let's say the Apostles' Creed together. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. The Wishart family are now going to lead us in prayer. Hi, we're the Wishart family. We normally attend the 10 a.m. service at St Andrews. Today we'll be leading you in prayers. Uh, we've sourced these prayers from the Sydney Anchor website. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you with heavy hearts, longing for your comfort and your grace. In the midst of COVID-19 spreading across the globe, we ask in your mercy that you would stop this pandemic and restore harmony and health to the nations, especially Australia. We also pray for those who govern us, for our Prime Minister, Premiers and Chief Ministers, for their courageous leadership and national cooperation across states and territories. Grant them wisdom in their decisions as they navigate the threats to lives and livelihoods. We also pray for our police, our emergency services and Defence Force personnel as they seek to maintain order in our country. May all Australians respect their work, accept the limitations on our freedoms and seek the welfare of others for the good of all. We pray for ourselves and our families, especially those who have lost loved ones to this disease or those suffering from its effects. May we know the peace that passes understanding as we place our trust in Jesus, in whose powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the God of all compassion and comfort. We thank you that you listen to our prayers. We pray today for our world, our nation, our city, and our church as the coronavirus spreads. Please bring help to all our communities according to their needs. Heal those afflicted and strengthen all who have the responsibility for care. In your mercy, please provide a cure and give wisdom to those seeking to develop a, a vaccine for this condition. We pray too for ourselves. Enable us to walk by faith. Help us to be careful and wise in taking whatever precautions are necessary to limit and contain the spread of this virus. Strengthen us to remain calm while vigilant. Responsible citizens seeking the welfare of others above ourselves. At times of uncertainty and anxiety, Help our world to look to security in your Son, Jesus Christ, and give courage to Christians as we point others to the one in whom there is always hope. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, you are worthy of all praise as the one who created all things, sustains all things, and is moving all things towards the glorious conclusion you've planned for them. We thank you especially for sending your Son, that through him we have forgiveness and life and hope. Thank you for your wonderful plan of redemption and for fellowship we now have with you through your Son and in your Spirit. Father, our world is broken 
and we are more aware of that than ever as a result of this COVID pandemic. We long for that day when every tear will be wiped away, when death will be no more, and there will be no more grief or pain. But we know we are not there yet, and we pray that you might enable us to live as your light in the midst of this darkness, testifying to your continued goodness and the hope that has been secured for your, all your people through the death and resurrection of Jesus. We pray that you might sustain us in all that you've given us to do in this moment. Especially we pray for those involved in education and training. As our schools seek to continue their important work in stressful and difficult circumstances, would you please keep teachers and students safe and help them to care for each other? We pray for those who are facing critical points in their education, particularly those preparing for their final exams and assessments towards the HSC, and ask for a diligence in study that is surrounded at every point by a calm confidence in you and your provision. We pray for those training for Christian ministry in this context. Please enable them to grow in faith and love and in the knowledge of your word. May they be shaped by you in ways which will prepare them well for what lies ahead on the other side of this pandemic. Would you pour out your spirit and enable a new season of evangelism, Christian growth and healthy church life to emerge in the months ahead. Father, all our hope is in you. We trust your promises and look forward to the day to come when uh, look forward to the day to come when the Lord Jesus will return to bring all your purposes to their fulfillment. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please join with me in the Lord's prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come, that your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today your daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Hello, my name is Eunice, and with my family we normally attended the 10am service. Today's reading comes from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 33. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's great to be with you. Thank you for letting me into your uh, your home, whether it's uh, your lounge, your kitchen, or wherever you're watching this. Uh, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful that you've given the time uh, to, to turn to God's word. And let's do that together. And I'll pray as I begin so that we might be moved by God's Spirit to accept and understand his word. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we do ask that uh, as we come to Mark's Gospel, uh, and particularly this part uh, of the story, the narrative of Jesus' life, where he he reveals his identity so clearly, I pray that uh, this might move us and change us. And I also pray that what I say won't get in the way. I ask that you'll help me to be clear and careful with your word. Amen. Mark chapter 8 is where we're looking, Um, but I want to actually start by quoting something um, uh, some of you from uh, who, who, like me, come from a different century might remember. There was a rock band, poets of another era, if you like, called The Who, and uh, they penned these words, very profound, uh, in in a song that was called Who Are You? 
and the words went, who, 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 who. Uh, obviously very profound. Um, and the, but the big question that's asked by Jesus in this passage is that very thing. It's who. Who, who do people say I am? Uh, so Jesus is with his disciples. He's in his home territory and he asks them, who do people think I am? And who, who do you think I am? Perception often leads us to behaviour. The way we perceive things and what we understand will often lead us uh, to act, respond uh, in ways that um, are shaped by what we understand, what we perceive. But perceptions are not always reality. Uh, this is a transcript which is read to a group I was in um, when I was uh, in business, uh, an actual transcript um, I was told, of a US naval ship um, in touch with Canadian authorities. Uh, it, it, it goes like this. 0835, fog descends. Americans, transmit this message by radio. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid collision. Canadians respond. We recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. Americans, this is the captain of the US Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. Canadians, no. I say again, you divert your course. <laughs> the Americans, this is the aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln. We're accompanied by three destroyers and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of our ships. Canadians, this is a lighthouse. It's your call. <laughs> it was apparently to give us lessons on situational awareness or treating perceptions as reality. And my question to you today is, what's your perception of Jesus? What's it based on? Uh, many people in Sydney today say they don't need Jesus and they do that either actively and saying, I do not need Jesus, or they do it passively, just by their way of life, by their attitude. Uh, they show that, that Jesus just doesn't have an impact on them at all. And I believe both of those responses are based on their perception of who he is and what they perceive he isn't. So if your perception is, I don't need Jesus, then you will ignore him. If your perception is, he's a Middle Eastern teacher from 2,000 years ago, and that's all, a good bloke, no doubt, then why would I need him? If, if you don't believe you need God, if you perceive there's no life after death, then you would not want to have anything to do with him. Richard Dawkins, Tim Minchin, Ricky Gervais, celebrities who have uh, very publicly declared that they don't believe in Jesus. Their perception of God is the same, they say, uh, as their perception of the fairies at the bottom of the garden. But the passage we read today says Jesus is more than a teacher and that there is life after death. So here's my question. Will you insist on your perception and risk a head-on collision? Or will you reassess your view and change your course in light of what he says? Perceptions do influence our thoughts. Uh, that, that's true. And our thoughts obviously influence, influence our decisions. We may well say, don't judge a book by its cover, but we almost always do. And first, we say first impressions shouldn't count, but they almost always do. And our impressions lead to our perceptions, our perceptions lead to our thoughts, our thoughts lead to our decisions, and our decisions lead to our actions. And so often we do live by perceptions, as if our perceptions are reality. You might remember Bob Ansett. Above his door, in his office, were those words, perception is reality. And yet Jesus shows in this passage that perceptions can be very wrong and what matters is not our perception, but reality. 
In verse 27 of Mark chapter 8, Jesus is having a conversation about people's perceptions of his identity. And in verse 28, his disciples answer and say, some say you are John the Baptist, others say you're Elijah, still others, you're one of the prophets. Today in Sydney, there are many people, particularly those in the Islamic uh, faith, those of the Muslim community, who are happy to say Jesus is one of the prophets. Others say he's a good teacher. But many say it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter because who he was, who he says he was, it's, it's kind of irrelevant. In fact, it's just a personal thing. Uh, you know, that's, it's, it's what you want to believe, that's fine. Uh, it's, it's just your opinion. You've got yours, I've got mine, that's it. That perception of it doesn't matter will result in actions which will dismiss Jesus. Decisions determined largely by those perceptions. Some people think it doesn't matter. This passage would suggest it matters greatly. And so Jesus says in verse 29, do you notice? What about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter answers very quickly, you are the Messiah. Now, when, when he answers in verse 29, you're the Messiah, Jesus takes it as a correct answer. He doesn't say, oh, well, 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 wait a minute. In fact, Jesus says to that, um, you are the Messiah, that response from Peter, he warns them not to tell anyone. The reason is because of perceptions and people's misunderstandings about who the Messiah would be. Tim Keller helpfully writes about the Messiah in one of his books. He says, the Messiah, the king to end all kings, the king who's going to put everything right. When Peter says, you are the Messiah, he's saying Jesus, in accepting the title, uh, is the one who is going to put everything in order for the Jewish nation. He immediately turns around and begins to say things that they find appalling and shocking. It's as if Jesus says, yes, I am the king, but I'm not anything like the king you're expecting. The Messiah was going to be the king to end all kings. When Peter acknowledges that Jesus is the Messiah here, he's saying, you're the one that the prophets told us would come. In Daniel chapter 2, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream of a statue, a, a golden head, silver chest, bronze legs, clay feet. They, they represent the kingdoms of the world and they are all pulverised when a rock appears. Uh, it's cut but not with human hands and it overtakes all the kingdoms of the world and it's established forever. It's God's kingdom. That's the Messiah. That's the one they're looking for. They're waiting for that one. Micah said in chapter 5 verse 2 the messiah the anointed one god's promised one would be born in bethlehem in isaiah 9 he will come and and he will make a glorious way of the sea the land beyond the jordan in the in galilee of the nations mark 8 is set in galilee of the nations in chapter 8 verse 22 bethsaida a fishing village is on the shores of Galilee. Verse 27, the villages of Caesarea, Philippi, are on the northern side of Galilee, fulfilling what Isaiah said would happen. Isaiah 35, verse 5, also says, the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. In chapter 7, Jesus has come to Galilee, just as Isaiah foretold. And the first thing he does is he heals a man who's deaf. He unstops the ears of, a, of the deaf. He feeds multitudes miraculously, just as God fed multitudes in the Exodus miraculously. And so I can understand in chapter 8, verse 21, and here, will you please forgive me, Darren, but I'm going into the passage that's not mine. Um, but that's only because you didn't give me the right verses. In chapter 8, verse 21, he says to them, do you still not understand? In other words... I can hear his frustration. Your perceptions are wrong. Do you not get it? Isaiah said exactly the same. Do you not understand? Born in Bethlehem, born to a virgin, healing the deaf, um, giving sight to the blind. Do you not get it? 
Next we read that he heals this blind man. And just as Isaiah said, the blind will receive their sight. I think that miracle is an enacted parable. And in fact, by doing it here, Jesus is showing that he gives sight to the blind and the problem is the disciples have still got poor eyesight. In that miracle, the blind man is given his sight, but he can't see clearly. His perception is wrong. He thinks men look like trees. The disciples here struggle to see clearly. They understand Jesus is a Messiah. Peter said as much, but they don't understand what that means. Jesus, to heal that man, spits. Now, spitting is actually uh, recognised as a sign of rejection and contempt in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. You, you might remember uh, at, when Jesus is arrested and beaten, they spat upon him. It was a sign of contempt. There's also a widespread belief that spit contains the essence of a person. So if an unclean person spat on you, you were declared to be unclean. Uh, Leviticus 15.8 actually allows for that. There you go. There's obviously a belief that spit would spread something often bad. Boy, in COVID times, uh, we've, we've learned that's true, haven't we? And so in many of the churches where our, our congregations have returned, people are wearing masks so that there can be no transmission of an illness through spit. I guess there's... Um, the proof of that is in that old little, that little ditty, coughs and sneezes spread diseases. But there's also a belief that a good person could spread goodness and healing properties uh, by the same method. Um, I think my mum used to do that. Whenever I went to her with an injury, she would kiss it better. That very idea comes from this um, strange idea about spit. And Jesus uses saliva. He uses his spit he is a good man who uses what transfers the essence of a person to heal this blind man. The Pharisees had insisted that Jesus was an illegitimate. Mary and Joseph were unwed. Jesus was, was, the, uh, was not a legitimate firstborn. So his spit was therefore, and therefore, in their opinion, powerless to heal. And what do we see? He uses his spit to heal a blind man, to give sight to the blind. He uses his powers to give hearing to the deaf. He's showing his followers very clearly he's the one that was promised by God, the Messiah who would come. And although Peter identified him correctly, his perceptions about him needed to be adjusted. He needed to change his course so that he would correctly identify Jesus and what the Messiah was to do. And so we see in verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus takes him to one side and explains what's so, so alarming. Is it in verse 33, Jesus' rebuke is so strong. It seems too tough. You know why it's so harsh? It's because this is a matter of life and death. If reality is different to your perception, you need to change your perception because you can't change reality. If you want to save your life, says Jesus, you need to be prepared to lose it. Chapter 8, verse 35. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. If you live your life with you at the centre, with your ambitions as your goal, if you live your life without reference to him and without regard for him, then you've been saving life for yourself. And Jesus says, don't do that. For if you do that, you will lose the very thing you desire. Instead, surrender to the Messiah. I, this is a tough reality to accept. And I'm sure that there are some people who are listening to me right now who are thinking, if that's Christianity, this is too hard. It's too much for me. But I want to challenge your perceptions to look at who Jesus is. You see, what he's saying here is that he is 
the one who will establish a kingdom that lasts forever. He is the one who has the answer to life. And our perceptions of him, whether they are of a meek and mild teacher from the Middle East or whatever they might be, need to be adjusted to that reality. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. We need to actually realise who he is, the reality of who he is, and come to him and accept him on that basis rather than on the basis of our perceptions. So if you've never come to that, can I invite you today to reconsider what your perceptions of him are, to look through Mark's gospel? It won't take you long to read it, but to just to look at how he, he shows that all the promises that God made about the one who had put things right are fulfilled in him. In fact, all God's promises find their yes in Jesus. I know these are hard words. But what good would it be for you to gain everything in this life and to ignore him because your perceptions were wrong? In verse 36, that's exactly what Jesus says. You know, back in the 1980s when I was working in, in finance, uh, Christopher Scase was one of the big gurus. Alan Bond, Rene Rivkin, Kerry Packer. Their prophets have paid for their tombstones. Their perceptions of Jesus, at least their public ones, were all wrong. I want to challenge anyone who's listening to this to adjust your perception of who Jesus is, to understand that he is the Messiah. But I also want to say something uh, to those of us who have agreed, yes, like Peter, you are the Messiah, but we still don't really understand what that means, that he is the king and we live in obedience to him. Uh, can I ask you, what drives your week? What, what makes you uh, decide on the things that you will do? Is it obedience to him and seeking to honour him? Or are you being tempted by the many things in this world to go for them, to live just like everybody else? You see, I think that was the challenge the disciples faced. Uh, they wanted Jesus to do the things that would help them and establish them, probably as leaders in this new kingdom. We do it by saying, God bless my business, please give me more money so that I can have a really nice life here in, you know, in Australia. I, I don't know what it would be for you, but I do want to ask you, I do want to challenge you about your view of the Messiah. Do you really obey his command? Have you had opportunity to turn the other cheek? If someone asks you for help, uh, do you offer to go just the extra mile with them? Yeah. It, it sounds like a bit of a hard job, doesn't it? But I often think that's because of our perceptions too. I want to say to you that I actually think this is where our freedom comes as Christians. We get to live in the way we've been designed to live. I want to share with you the joy it is to actually be involved in doing things in obedience to the King. That, that's my life's experience. And it requires me to constantly be working on my perceptions. It requires me to keep asking myself, who, 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 Lord Jesus, who are you in my life? Are you really the King? And then for me to change my perceptions of him. And the best way to do that, to have my perceptions changed to reality and, and formed by reality, is to be in his word. Uh, I'm so glad you've spent this time with me this morning or this evening or wherever, it is, wherever you are in listening to this, in allowing God's word and what it reveals about who Jesus is to change your perceptions so that they might be closer to reality. And, and how about we pray now that God would continue to do that for us. Let's pray. Dear Father, I do ask that you would help us as our perceptions need to be adjusted, that by your word and by your spirit, you would adjust our perceptions to understand the reality of who Jesus is. Give us a bigger and richer view of him. Amen.
joy in sorrow's tears My strength to cast out fears No other Thanks for joining us today from wherever you are. Hasn't it been good the way Mark's gospel has brought the reality about Jesus into clearer focus, uh, enabling us to change our heading and, and miss running aground as our perception of who Jesus is and his claim on our lives takes hold of our whole being. We'll be looking further into what it means to follow Jesus next week. And there are some quite surprising things that Jesus says. There's a hardness to it and there's a sweetness to it. And I'm looking forward to sharing that with you next week. But let's close our time together uh, today by saying this prayer, which comes from uh, the service of the Lord's Supper. Loving Father, through faith in your Son and his saving death, our sins are forgiven and we share in the life of his body. With gratitude for all your mercies, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Have a good week. And if you need anything, you need to talk to someone, um, please feel free to contact the office or one of us uh, on the email addresses which will appear. God bless.